panel, Make Media, Make Change. This panel is organized by uh, ESODOC, European Social Documentary. It's a, a training project from the media program for documentary projects uh, with social impact and also for cross-media projects. And this panel takes place inside of the documentary campus industry sessions. I want to present you Manuela Winkler. And if you want to talk with us about the training programs, documentary campus or ESODOC, you can come to us after this session. And um, now I want to present you the moderator of the session. It's Sabine bubek Parts, who is commissioning editor with ZDF RT. And from this year on, she is the head of studies of ESODOC. Sabine, <laughs> good uh, entertainment. Thank you, Heidi. Uh, very warm welcome to all of you this morning, or no, not even morning anymore. Um, make media, make change. This sounds uh, quite easy, simple and direct. We all want to make um, media and we all want to work for change. But how does it work practically? <coughs> Um, and what does this process need? So we invited a very interesting panel and I want to go uh, to present you the, the speakers. To my left will be the first speaker, Angelo Loy, uh, who was working for an NGO called AMREF. Uh, he was working for 14 years with street kids in Africa and with a concept called uh, participatory video. To my right, we have uh, Sine Birge Sörensen, a producer from Final Cut from Real, Denmark, who was working um, with uh, Joshua Oppenheimer's uh, The Act of Killing and The Look of Silence, and uh, confronting the Indonesian political system. We have then Matteo Moretti from Italy, from uh, the design department of the Free University of Bolzano, who was looking for a strategy to change the cliches of the South Tyrolians uh, towards the Chinese community there. And then last but not least, <laughs> Sarah Mosses from Together Films, impact producer, who made it to her profession to help people to develop strategies to turn media into a tool for change. So welcome to all of you and uh, let's start with Angelo. Okay, so um, I have 10 minutes to tell you about uh, more than one decade of uh, work with street uh, children in Nairobi in participatory video. I'll try to be concise and I'll try not to be too much confused. Um, the organization I've been working with is called AMREF, which is the African Medical and Research Foundation. It's an African-based organization, which is the major, probably the major NGO working in East Africa. And they deal mostly with health issues, but at a certain point they realize that if they want to deal with health issues regarding children, they had to get the children out of the street. So in 1999 they set up a project which is called Children in Need, for the rehabilitation of street children. And at that time they asked me uh, to do a, some sort of a institutional short film on the project. Uh, and this is where uh, we started a discussion with the communication officer in AMREF and which, with the project manager in Nairobi, the African project manager, John Wiruri. Uh, the point was, uh, where we are now, what, where are we coming from? We were coming from, I, you, can, you can read, decades of Western representation of Africa and decades of NGOs, re, communication strategy shortcuts. What I mean is that usually the images used in communication by most NGOs are the same from the Biafran crisis in the late 60s. Always you have the child uh, crying in front of the camera of the photography, or maybe lately you have a child uh, smiling, 
but there is always this kind of images that is used. So probably NGOs are the major responsible for the transmission of stereotypes during the last two decades. Um, we were coming from uh, uh, what we consider a very uh, uh, discussed film about Abbas Kiarostami, which is called ABC Africa, which, is, which it looks like to us uh, uh, some sort of touristic representation of Africa made uh, by a big director. Uh, so we were very disappointed by these images he was giving about Uganda. And we were coming from uh, Werner Herzog film on the flying doctors in, Amri in, uh, in Africa. In the late 60s, Herzog made this film about the flying doctors going to outreach in Africa to reach people who didn't have access to health care. And he finishes the film with a very interesting question, is that are we able to communicate with these people? And in order to be effective in what we do, we have to communicate properly. Otherwise, what we do in Africa is just simple curing the superficial symptoms of what's happening. And this is what's late 60s. This film was never used by the NGO because it, it was counterproductive for them, because it was very critical. While Abbas Kiarostami's film was very much used by the NGOs, and it was even in Cannes. So we were puzzled about all these questions. The other thing is that we were reading at that time what we consider the major uh, African uh, thinkers, with, like Chinua Achebe or Gugi Wathiongo from Kenya, and always about speaking about representation of Africa and also some very good uh, Brazilian pedagogue, which is Paulo Freire. So all these elements were coming into the discussion for one single project that was just make this damn institutional film about <laughs> our children in need project in Africa. Uh, okay, but what this led to was that we tried to have an approach to combine different aspects of the issue. There was the communication need of the organization. There was the issue of beneficiaries. In the first place, the beneficiaries for us had to be the children themselves. Then we were trying to bring this new perspective on African problems and, uh, and use new pedagogical tools. That's how we came out with participatory video. Participatory video is a technique which uh, the common definition is allows group of people of community to represent themselves via an uh, audiovisual tool. It has a very strong uh, pedagogical uh, background, meaning that the process, how you teach filmmaking is very different from a vertical approach. Like if now if I had to do a session on participatory video, I will teach Sabine how to put a battery in a camera, and Sabina will teach Senior how to, to do it. So it's peer-to-peer -peer education. And it starts from this very basic and important principle. There are organizations who work in participatory video in, in the UK, like Inside Share, that are almost only interested in the process. They are not interested in the products, not as much as the process, because the process is very, very good. It's very inclusive, it's very interesting. Then there are, there are other approaches, like uh, Witness, which, use, which was founded by Peter Gabriel, who empowers uh, some kind of extreme citizen journalism in very difficult circumstances to denounce things that are happening in that particular place. So they are very much interested in the products. In AMREF, we were interested in both. We were interested in the process because we were dealing with children and we were interested in the products because they had to be broadcast, they had to have a good audience. So. Films made by the children who had the possibility to go on TV. But you can see the, the whole process here is uh, it's from 2002 uh, to 2014. Uh, we started with a very simple project, including just six boys and two girls in Nairobi. We, we, we can call it an observational documentary on street life. So it's a very deep inside look into street life. And then, starting from that period, we managed to follow two strategies. One was including a large number of boys and girls. So you can see the second project, which is called the African Spelling Book. 
uh, which included about 72 boys and girls. And from that on, we tried to, to work with boys who were very talented to make short films and at the same time continuing to, to work with big groups of boys and girls. Uh, as you can see, uh, productions-wise, uh, um, we were working with production companies. We were not allowed to use one single dollar of the organization that was meant to go to the rehabilitation of the children. So we had to fund raise in other, for other sources, mainly broadcasters. And uh, up to 2010, uh, where we made this last uh, uh, international product, uh, we had a chance to uh, raise funds for a school. So imagine there is the rehabilitation center now. They have many activities, but nowadays one of the activities the children can do is actually um, attend a participatory video school, which is run by the local staff. So we, we had two years to train the local staff in all the issues concerning camera, sound, editing, uh, animation, storytelling, and after two years, they were able to run the school. So I'm finished with this, and they are starting. And the first thing they did is in, was in 2014, it's called Child for Hire. It's a series for television. And I, I, ironically, I, I'm a documentary filmmaking, filmmaker. And ironically enough, they, they decided to turn into fiction. So actually, they are doing series right now in fiction film. How much time do we have left? Um, yeah. three, huh? three minutes. Yes. OK. I will show you just some maybe picture. Let's see, let's see. Okay, this is to show you just some pictures. You can see we're working with small children, uh, also with adults. Well, this is just to give you a picture of the place and the atmosphere. Uh, and now I want to show just uh, I want to show you a three minutes clip of the African Spelling Book, which was probably our most uh, important production. It was produced by the National Geographic Channel, and it was aired in uh, 140 countries around the world. So in terms of participatory video for us, this is our landmark. So I leave you with this uh, independence, which is also what they have become now in terms of the school. So they are independent. They are going on their own step. Thank you very much. Thank you, Angelo. Um, now we will change from from Africa to Indonesia. Yeah, um, well, thanks very much for inviting me to talk about the outreach for uh, the act of killing and the look of silence. Um, how many people here have actually seen the look of silence? Okay, so then I'll not spend time on the, on the uh, showing the trailers because they uh, are available on the websites. So for, there's a website for the Look of Silence and there's one for the, uh, the, act, uh, the Act of Killing, so you can see them there afterwards. But I just want to um, start by saying that uh, the Act of Killing and the Look of Silence from the beginning uh, by Joshua Oppenheimer, who's the director, and, and by me and the whole team around it was seen as one project. We wanted to tell uh, the stories both uh, about the perpetrators in Indonesia of these killings that took place in 1965-66. And we also wanted to uh, tell the, the story about the survivors, the victims, or seen from their point of view. Uh, but we wanted to do it in a way where uh, each of these films were mirroring the way that, that either the perpetrators were seeing the whole thing or talking about it, boasting about it. And for the survivors, we wanted to have their aesthetics take over the whole film and, and project their uh, experience of, of uh, being suppressed in Indonesia for so many years, not just at the time, but all the years afterwards until now. Um, 
But the whole project actually, or the way that the whole thing started, was also a participatory project because Joshua Oppenheimer, uh, together with Christine Sin, his uh, collaborator at the time, they went to Indonesia in 2001 to do a film called The Globalization Tapes, or not a film, as such, it, it was a film in the end, but the whole idea was that it should be a participatory project for people on a plantation um, in Indonesia uh, talking about what globalization meant to them and doing the films uh, or doing a film about it together with Josh and Christine. So, and this film should then be used by uh, international food, food workers unions all around the world uh, to discuss these issues. And it was actually <coughs> while uh, talking to these people um, and, and experience their daily life on a plantation on North Sumatra that, that just in the first hand, uh, or first, for the first time actually found out that these killings had taken place and that they were, ex of course, extremely important for the whole understanding of, of life uh, by these people that he was working with. Because on those plantations, people, uh, the people he was working with were in the unions and the reason why the unions were so weak in Indonesia at this time was because people in 65, 66 had been prosecuted for even being in a union. Because then they were seen as communists and, and, uh, and they were the ones to, to be uh, exterminated by, by the right wing that took over at the time. So a lot of these people that just met on doing the globalization tapes had family members who had either been killed or imprisoned in 65, 66. And so they told him about both the fact that, that these things had happened, but also the fact that a lot of the people who had uh, done the killings were still living in this area and were, in fact, the neighbors of the same survivors' families. And it was also very clear very soon that most of the people who have lost family members, most of the people who were survivors, had uh, been extremely poor ever since these events happened, and most of the people who had been on the winning side and been perpetrators had, had gone up in the world, had gone, got, and got great positions, become head of the local education system, head of uh, the local representatives in parliament, all of that kind of thing. So that whole, what happened in 65, 66, that defined the whole politics and economics of the region ever since. Um, then when Just found out about this, he wanted, after the globalization tapes, to do a film with the survivors about what they had experienced. And he started, uh, he started doing that. But it was also very clear that, that the Indonesia had been in dictatorship until 90, 1998, and the military and the police were still very much present in the countryside. And so people were very afraid of talking. And they were also the ones who were talking to Josh and, uh, about these things and when he was sort of starting to film after the globalization <coughs> tapes had, had been finished, they also experienced that the police would turn up and warn them about being involved in these kind of things. So he very, uh, it, it was very clear that it would be extremely difficult to make these, uh, for the survivors to talk and make a film about this that could come out anywhere. So he's, they all sat down and discussed what, what can we do about this? Because we want this story to be told and, and we want this out. And, and one of the people in the group suggested, why don't, we, uh, why don't you go and film the perpetrators? They are boastful. They want to talk about all of these things. If you can make them talk, the world will see what, the way that they're thinking about this and recognize the, how horrible the whole thing is. And they will also tell about what really happened. And, and to a large extent, all people knew were that their family members had one night been arrested and then disappeared. Most of the killings had happened at night at the river uh, by paramilitaries. And of course, people knew that a lot of bodies had been found in the rivers, but they usually didn't know exactly what had happened to their family members. So they also wanted to figure that out for that particular region where they were. And so, of course, that was a huge step for just to do. I mean, how do you go up to someone and say, you know, how, how were you involved in killings in, in 65? But he realized that hanging out outside and asking people, the, uh, the first perpetrator, one, the, actually the first one that he ever talked to, you see in the beginning of, of uh, The Look of Silence, um, that if he just asked about their life, what had they done in their life, this would come out very easily. They would start themselves to talk about this and they would very fast go and, and uh, and wanted to show him where they had done the killings and talk about the details and so on. 
So that's when he started doing what you could call a mapping of how these things, hap these things happen in the whole area. And basically trying to find out what had been the, the hierarchy, what had been the, 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 the command routes of, of what had happened exactly in this place. And that took him to about 40 different perpetrators before he found Anwar in Medan, which was the nearest biggest town and where the power had been sort of uh, collected. But, and so only in 2005, after having filmed with a lot of other perpetrators, he met Anwar and started all the filming that became the act of killing. And that filming took place over several shoots uh, of several months from, from 2005 to 2012. But before that, he had filmed with all these perpetrators in this very particular area in North Sumatra in the plantation belt. And they were the ones he had also at that time very early met uh, Adi and Adi's family, and they, he knew about their story because Ramli, his, Adi's brother, his killing was known <coughs> because he had been, um, he had managed to run away on the truck that was taking him and, and 29 other people to the river. Two other people had escaped and he had been wounded and run home to his family and there's been a lot of witnesses to his killing. And he was also buried in a grave in this plantation. So the, he was like the focal point of the killings in this region. So just knew this and in parallel with filming with Anwar and the other people in Medan, we were continuing to, to film with the people in, um, in the countryside with the survivors and also when we finally we knew that after having filmed the act of killing and before it came out, we needed to do the last filming we could do for the look of silence because we didn't expect to be able to go back to Indonesia straight after the act of killing coming out. So we needed to do that. And then we went back to Adi and his family because we knew that Ramli's story was very important and they, we also knew they wanted to participate in this film. And then Adi was the one suggesting that he would go and and confront the perpetrators involved in his brother's death. Um, and we could do that. Of course, at first we said, no way, that's too problematic, that's too dangerous, it's not, it can't be done. But he was very insisting. And then we, together with the Indonesian crew that had already worked with us for many years on, on all of this, devised a strategy for doing it. And, um, and he could, we, we had access to these people because Joss had filmed all of them between 2003 and 2005. So they knew him, they knew us, that they knew uh, the, the people we were working with and we could call them up and say, can we come and talk to you again? So this is where I put the rough timeline of, of, the, of the filming. But the release is, in, in, is what I'm mainly going to talk about here. And that uh, is because it's, it's basically the same model we have used for both the act of killing and the look of silence, but there's been a lot of differences from the point where um, the act of killing came out first and we were uh, very, very, very careful in the way we were bringing it out. And because of all the changes that that film already had started to make, we could bring out the look of silence in more or less the same model, but in a, a still a much more open way. So that's, that's the next part of, of this. Um, yeah, and then while we still have this rough timeline, I just want to uh, say that of, uh, we didn't just do the releases of any of these films. In spring 2012, we, we went and had, with the whole Indonesian team that had been involved in making the act of killing, we were, or the key team, we had a, uh, a release meeting in Indonesia and planned how the film should come out in Indonesia with them before it came out internationally. And we did the same thing in spring 2014 for the, for the look of silence, not in Indonesia, but somewhere else. Then I just wanna show this picture because this is Josh on the left and uh, Carlos, our uh, Col um, Colombian uh, cinematographer filming the act of killing. You don't see any Indonesians here and you don't see any Indonesians on any of our pictures anywhere on our website. And that's because they are anonymous and, and that's their choice and our, we have wanted also for it to be that way for their safety. Um, and that is also a change I'll come back to with Adi because of course he's, by being the main character in The Look of Silence, he's taking a huge step out of that anonymity that has otherwise been a principle. 
Then I've sort of made seven principles for the global release that, that we try to follow when the, the first, when the act of killing came out and, uh, and also more or less for the look of silence. And that's, we wanted to make the biggest possible impact we could ever make in, uh, in Indonesia. And we thought if we can get an A festival, that is something that's hard to just, you know, not mention it, even in the Indonesian press. And then we also wanted uh, to go out in cinemas as opposed to television. Of course, we wanted television, and television was a huge important part of the finance of this film because it's impossible to finance this kind of thing on, on cinema minimum guarantees. You wouldn't get them at all. And I know because it took me five years to finance the act of killing, and I never got them. <laughs> but, but I got television. But we needed cinema releases because journalists write about cinema releases, journalists write about festivals, but they don't write about the other stuff. Um, then we needed uh, always to feed in from uh, what happened in internationally into the Indonesian press and what happened in Indonesia into the, the international press. And then we wanted one spokesperson for the film, and that had to be Josh both because he's the director, so of course it should be him, but also because he speaks Indonesian, so he could always follow what was going on in, in the public sphere, in the media in Indonesia, and also internationally, and, and, uh, and cross-fertilize those two. And then we wanted the, the outreach in Indonesia, or the release of the films, to be as peaceful as possible, and as safe as possible for the people uh, actually showing the films because we were worried, especially with the act of killing, that if the paramilitaries would be angry at the film or at us and couldn't reach us because we were out of the country, they would attack the screenings. And, and that was a real worry for all the organizers in, the, in Indonesia also. And then we wanted the Indonesian outreach to be controlled with the Indonesian team, but all legal matters had to be outside of Indonesia so that nobody in Indonesia could be uh, taken into by the police or questioned or be told to say this is uh, you know you are responsible for this. So in Indonesia, everything is referred to Final Cut for Real in Denmark. There's no Indonesian organisations involved. Um, I think I still have one and a half minutes. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'll skip this one then. Here, this other thing is for the Indonesian release. Um, we had this whole group that had been involved in making the films, and they are basically also the core team that have brought out both the act of killing and the look of silence in Indonesia. We have had consultations with local lawyers about this. Uh, we've devised safety strategies, especially in relation to the look of silence, moving the family and uh, getting them out of that area where the people who are perpetrators in the look of silence film have their power. They don't have it nationally, they have it more regionally. And then this peaceful approach, which, which we've chosen, what we did was instead of bringing the film out in cinemas like you could have done, but the problem is if you want to do that in Indonesia, you have to send the film to the censorship board, and if it's uh, cut down or they, they want to take something out, or if it's forbidden, then it's also a crime to actually show the film. But if you don't take it to commercial cinemas, it's, not a, it's a gray area. It's, it's not, you're not doing anything illegal by showing it. And so that's the uh, approach we took. Instead of taking <clears throat> the one where you, we could have had it forbidden and had this huge thing in the press and, and gone that way, but we knew that would be very provocative and we didn't want to be provocative. We want people to see the film, talk about it, even if they had to do it in closed community screenings where they were, knew each other and faith felt safe about it. And we, we wanted that process to happen for as long as possible. And that also meant we, we decided to have DVDs given out for free all around the country in the Indonesian uh, versions first. And then, of course, we wanted everyone to have access to see it. And if you didn't want to go to a meeting or you felt scared about that, that you could see it in the safety of your own home. But we, first, we wanted to make room for those screenings because we knew they could generate discussions that were important to have. And then so later on, we, we released it for free on the internet so that everyone could download it from their home. I, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm only halfway through, but I, my 15 minutes are up, and you will have to ask questions, and then I'll come back. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Sina. I know, I mean, we could go on for <laughs> four hours. <laughs> so uh, we make a big jump now, really big jump, um, to South Tyrol. <laughs> 
Thank you, Sina. We make a big jump to South Tyrol, to Matteo Moretti. Uh, and as I said, he is from the design department from the Free University in um, Bolzano. Um, dealing with journalism and journalistic uh, issues and finding <laughs> communication um, solutions f through graphic design. Hello, my name is Matteo Moretti. I am the coordinator of People's Republic of Bolzano, that is a visual journalist project that tries to open a public deba debate in the local community about the local Chinese community perception because some years ago and even last year local people felt invaded by the Chinese, even if maybe it's the only place in Italy we are assisting to a sort of Chinese integration instead of invasion. So we try to discover why people felt invaded and then open a debate and communicate in them that the situation is very different. Everything started uh, in 2014 when a friend of us, Zhu Vuxu, is a chef in a restaurant, asked us why local people fear the Chinese, what they fear exactly, maybe they fear an invasion. It's, it, was, it was a joke, but me and the journalist where I work with decided to, to take it seriously and join our forces and experiment new way of telling news and opening a local debate. So why, the, we ask themselves, why local people are scared in Bolzano where we don't even have a Chinatown? In fact, the first thing that you will discover when you get off the train in Bolzano is a series of traditional kiosks that offer Bavarian food. And the first one, really the first one, is owned by a Chinese guy that is called Yang Gui. And he serves and prepares Bavarian food, not Chinese food. So the first approach we tried was, okay, let's search for data, discover how many Chinese lives in Bolzano. And the result is very funny because we have just 633 Chinese on 100,000. So it means 0.6%. So definitely data says, no, there's no invasion. But then we try to go a little bit deeper, asking data from the um, uh, traders union. And we discover that there's something very strong from 2008 to 2011 where the Chinese opening business at the peak of 27 in 2010. That for a small city like Bolzano is a lot because it means more than two shops in a month. So, okay, we can imagine that local people felt a little bit invaded by these Chinese because then there are some factors like the, the Chinese are few but work often in the public space, differently from other communities that work in the field, so are very visible. But in the end, again, if we look to the data, out of 441 bars, just 51 are Chinese, so it's less than 12%. And the same for the restaurants that in the end are less than 12%. So we could talk, of course, that it's a very strong data. So the 0.6% of the population owns more or less the 12% of the restaurants and bar. But of course, they are great businessmen, but not invaders. It's a matter of words. Then we search on the media, why maybe media play the important role, and especially on Alto Adige, that is the most read newspaper by the Italian people in South Tyrol. The campaign against Chinese, it's not a very clear campaign, it's an ambiguous way to tell the news. Starting, if you look to the date under the, um, the title, it's 2011, the year of the Chinese explosion. So I put some translation in English. So the first news is Chinese breaks battle on the rails. Okay. The second one I found it's we have 150 Chinese bars, the Chinatown is in Claudia Augusta Street. And then we demonstrated that there's any Chinatown. And then some stupid news. Okay, now the Dolores Bar is owned by the Chinese. And then this one is very funny. The first Chinese mega store challenged the local shops. And if you look on the Google map, this is the Chinese mega store. So it's a normal shop. So again, it's a matter of words. And then it is very weird because the traders union um, wrote this article telling that there are too many Chinese and too many permission given to the Chinese. And this statement of the uh, vice president of the traders union is very weird because put a lot of pressure. And again, after one year, Lega Nord, that is a right-wing party, tells stop the Chinese advance. 
And then this is the, my favorite, Chen is one of the most diffuse surnames in Bolzano. And then if you go into the text, you discover that it's more or less the 37 or the 38 position. It's not, yes, it's one of the most diffuse, but it's not the first one or in the first 10. So we decided to open this window in order to debunk a Chinese invasion, but not only, also to return a complexity of a phenomenon, because usually the news are just made for entertaining and not to really inform. So for us, it was important to return the context and all the facets of, of this complexity. So I made a, um, a team made of a journalist, a sociologist, a designer and a computer scientist in order to tell the story from different point of view and in an engaging way. This is the first, is when you log in in our website, this is the first slide. We try to make a sort of visual metaphor representing the 0.6% or better how the Chinese are hybridating the South Tyrolean identity. So we took the traditional South Tyrolean face and put just a small part of his eyebrow, that it means the 0.6, so this is really how the local identity is contaminated. And then we go a little bit deeper, breaking some common ideas about Chinese. For example, people think that Chinese came just from the whole China, but it's not true. They come just from a small region called Zhejiang. And it's fun because this region, uh, you cannot read because it's written very small. By the way, this region that is more or less big, like the north of Italy, has more population that the whole Italy. So just to give some proportion about the phenomena. And then another interesting data is that compared to other Italian cities, the Chinese in Bolzano are one third or better, two thirds less than in other cities. And then we made an interactive map showing the Chinese business on the territory, showing that there are any Chinatown. And this map is interactive so you can filter uh, results according to activity, according to year and see also how the business are differentiated. So in the beginning, they opened just bar and restaurant, and now, especially starting 2011, they start opening a uh, tailor shop, uh, a clothes apparel shop, and so on. And then in order to give a face to the data, because data, yes, are meaningful, but are very cold in my opinion, thanks to the anthropologists, we made some qualitative interview to eight different Chinese, in order to show who the Chinese are and what they think. So we took different Chinese and just have one minute clip just to give you an idea. The girl is called Injun. She's arrived in Italy when she was 14 without knowing any word of Italian. And after five years, she attended the high school and after five years, five year, she got the maximum degree. And of course, she talked perfectly Italian. And in the end, she said, but it's easy, the Italian school, because in China, the, the, the education system is more uh, severe. And then we tried to open a public debate thanks to this website. And uh, it happened a strange thing because I tried to, uh, it's very hard to read, but I tried to show how it is gone. So on, it's a timeline with the publication on, on, the, on the left of the project. And then you know, on three different rows, I separated all the media where the, public, the, the project has been published. The first row refers to local media, then national media, and international media. So when we published the project, just two local newspapers, the one that supported, supported our project, published it without any strong debate. But then happened that after the publication of the Facebook page, a journalist from Der Spiegel, that is a famous German magazine, discovered um, this reality and decided to publish a spread on the Spiegel. And then, because in South Tyrol people look a lot of, to the German world, the local TV television and local newspaper, and especially Alto Adige, was forced to talk about that because even the Spiegel is talking about this, the Chinese of Bolzano. So thanks to Facebook and thanks to the Spiegel, finally we open a local debate and this is what happened. So finally the Alto Adige was pushed to publish this article. So which invasion? The Chinese are just the 0 0.6 and again, also, they made a, a spread of the paper newspaper. And then they opened a debate even on their Facebook page. And I tried to map all the, the comments. And then I compared the comments with past articles even on Facebook in order to contrast and see what's happened if our works gave a, a change. So what happened before? For example, 
this article, the one about too many permission to the Chinese businessman, collected 50 or 60 comments and the positive and negative are more or less the same, 40-40, and then a 10% of neutral. And in the end, with, I don't know, I, I would believe that thanks to our work, what happened is that the, now the um, comments were more positive than negative. And so this is what we did, and this is the way we, I tried to um, evaluate the, the change we, we, we would push to the, to the society. So thank you very much. And visit our website, it's also in English, and there is two versions, the English version and the South Tyrolean version that is half Italian and half German. And just, just a small advertisement, because I will publish our master in eco-social design that will start in September, that try to use design as a catalyst of change. If you're interested, there is the website designdisaster.unibz.it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matteo. <laughs> So three very different strategies of uh, change in uh, very different places. And uh, Sarah, we're waiting now for Sarah, who is um, uh, developing exactly uh, these strategies together with you, with the filmmakers and the production companies. Um, and yes, Sarah. Um, so before I start, who was in the session this morning that I did? Okay, I so said it's over a majority. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is because so many of you are in the session this morning, I'm gonna kind of carry on, I'll reinstate what I started with, but kind of carry on the conversation that we were having from this morning. So um, to summarize, who wasn't here this morning? Let's just double check. Okay, oh, it's half and half, okay. So <laughs> let's start with the other one person. Um, so I wanted to present a, a case study around a film called Ping Pong. Um, which was a film that was released uh, in 2012. And what I'm showing you here is um, from our evaluation document that Andrew Batley, the project manager, pulled together. Um, and the reason why I want to start by showing you the evaluation documentation is to get you thinking about measuring and capturing evidence for the projects that you're doing. So um, Ping Pong is a feature documentary by a UK um, team. It was their first feature film. Um, I was the impact producer for it when I was working at the Brit Doc Foundation and we wanted to use the film as a way to reach new audiences primarily in um, older person settings where they could watch the film and then also take part in some kind of health and wellbeing program around playing table tennis. Um, it was an ambition, uh, ambitious project which we got a lot of funding from from the Big Lottery Fund to support the action that we were doing. Um, and that's why the evaluation that Andrew put together um, had to be so detailed because of the level of funding that was required um, to do this and deliver this campaign. You had to be able to report back in quite an effective manner. So the first things I want to kind of give things for you to think about with your own projects kind of as I go through this is when you're thinking about identifying like what your change goal perspective is, you really need to look at what are the measurable items that you can track as you go through. So... Um, this first kind of uh, graph is the kind of the central premise of it. So the film was about um, eight people over the age of um, 80 playing ping pong. And the first thing was, could we encourage other people over the age of 80 to want to play ping pong? Or, as it's phrased here, any other kind of physical activity. So we knew that ping pong wouldn't be the thing everyone would love, but it would start them thinking about being um, able to take part in sports because the film is basically a peer-to-peer -peer evidence of other people who've been through illnesses, been through cancer, um, lots of things have affected them, but they're still able to participate in that age. Um, so the, the, the first central question that we asked was like, after you've watched this film, do you want to do some kind of sport? And the way that we did that, um, a lot of people use things like SurveyMonkey, and there's online forums and questions through Facebook. We had to go completely back to just the basics of pen and paper. Um, we wanted to get kind of information from people viewing the film, so we would give them a um, exit survey after watching with a number of questions. So 
we started with the kind of ones that everyone wants to know, like, would you recommend this film to a friend? Yes or no? So then you can say, 99% of people would recommend this to their friend on all of your press and communications. So it's all the stuff that you want to get anyway. Out of five stars, what would you give this? So it's questions that as a filmmaker, it's really good to know what your audience thought. But as you went down through the, um, the form, it got a little bit more detailed. So would you like to go and play table tennis? Yes or no? Have you ever played table tennis? Yes or no? So we were trying to gather kind of what was their expectation. And importantly, um, especially for the kind of data geeks in the room, it was a mixture at all times of qualitative and quantitative data points. So some things were just kind of, have you ever played table tennis? Yes. Others were, how did this film make you feel? So we had a range of word options, like confident, inspired, upset. Sad. Some of the stories in the film are really heartbreaking. A, a woman has outgrown all of her children, she's 100, and she's still playing table tennis. So her story's actually quite sad, but at the same time, hopeful. So we wanted to know what was our audience feeling after they'd watched the film that then triggered them to do something kind of afterwards. So I definitely encourage everybody to have a form that you can give to your audience members afterwards, because it's really important for you to understand what your audience thinks and feels when they're watching it, but especially from diverse audiences. So when we did the same feedback forms um, in schools or with younger people, we'd get completely different reactions. Like all the kids were like, I can't believe grandparents swear because a couple of the old people swore. And it was like, wow, they, like, they really love that because there was an old woman swearing on screen. But it was different things that they would pick out of the project that they kind of came back to. So it's a lot of data entry. Um, after I left BritDoc, they, they brought another researcher to help it with it as well. And he just had to read through all of these forms, like hundreds and hundreds of form, forms and pull them together. But it's so useful to know what that feedback is. Because when you're running one of these campaigns, you have a set a plan of how you think it's going to roll out. And inevitably, you have to change something as you go through. And the change has to be geared around the reaction that you're getting from audiences. So you can do as much planning as possible and you can do as much research, but until you actually start to apply some of those elements, um, you don't know if it's going to be working or successful. So by getting that feedback from audiences straight away, you're able to adapt the plans um, that you had. So the other element is um, kind of the initial reach that we had assessed. So with this project, we knew that there were 20,000 care homes across the UK, and our core demographic aim was to screen the film um, in as many care homes as possible. So at first, I actually picked 1%. I wanted 200 out of the 20,000 to do an event. And working with one partner, AGK, we were able to tick off 200, which was great, because I did not think they were going to do that many. So then we changed, okay, let's try and get 10%. Let's get to our 2,000 care homes across the UK. And what we knew based from studies was how many people on average lived in those places. So we were able to ascertain that for most of the events in those care homes, there would be an average of around 30 people who would be present there, which meant that by the end of the year, we had personally reached 57,630 approximately. Um, from there. Um, now that's like a huge reach in terms of direct engagement with someone. If you imagine a broadcast, you could potentially be reaching millions of people, but it's very difficult to know what those people thought after watching that broadcast. You can track certain settings via social media, tracking what people are saying online, but again, I'm talking about 84-year-old Dot who doesn't know what Facebook is and has never seen Twitter, so I want to know what she feels and how she's reacted to it. So as part of your measurement of the way in which you're tracking your success, you've also got to think about the ways which are appropriate for your particular audience. So yes, we were monitoring social media and how people talked about it on Twitter and through press angles, but that wouldn't tell us what the 95-year-olds are thinking. We had to literally go and ask them directly. Um, and what was crucial in doing this was working with a variety of partners who were in those settings day and day because we actually asked them to track responses over a longer time. So with the people who were watching the film, so the kind of 30, 70 year old um, women sat in their lounge watching, we would ask them to su kind of submit reports on what they thought. And we would have to sometimes sit there with them and help them write those also, because they were struggling um, to write down. But we also asked the care home managers to do a slightly different report 
which was, have you noticed a change in the way people are acting? And three months later, have you picked up on kind of differences in attitudes towards physical and well-being, and physical health and well-being? And it was really good to know from the perspective of your partner organisation and also the direct audiences that you wanted to reach, which was down the bottom. Um, so an analysis of your audience is like so interesting when you actually kind of bring it up. And I would really encourage um, everybody to read evaluation reports. Um, the Harmony Institutes in New York does a range of them. BritDoc's website has a number of evaluations hosted there. And um, a lot more filmmakers are now kind of bringing up um, more information on their websites about what they've been achieving. Um, but it's really useful to actually see kind of where the film got to and, and how old and kind of what they were. And interestingly, 66% um, of the audience were females. Um, you can link that directly to uh, a number of other statistics where women are living longer than men. So actually within most of the care home settings, the wife had maybe outlived the husband and there were just more females in those areas. Um, but also some of the women were a bit more kind of, oh, we'll try that, darling, let's go and have a little go. And just a little bit more amenable to a new kind of concept. Um, just get through these a little bit. So this was a really crucial one for us. So yes, we wanted to um, kind of increase table tennis play, but the overall game of, aim of the film was increase, increase participation in any kind of sport. And so one of the key questions to the partners were, has there been an increase in interest for physical activity? Now the interest question was really important because with any kind of practical impact that you want to achieve, there's quite a lot of restrictions and resources you might need. So for the care home setting, we provided them with portable um, table tennis nets so you could clip them onto a table and play table tennis. Now, if 12 of the members of that home, so actually we really, really love this, like we would be interested in playing more, it gives an idea to the care home managers, well, maybe we should maybe get a proper table or maybe we should get some more equipment. So the increase in interest was really important because it could justify some of the care home managers actually getting more equipment in, or starting new sessions, maybe having other sports kind of coming into the area. So tracking that interest then became really important. Um, lots of social media coming through. Um, and this was then an observation question. So for the managers again, um, have you observed an increase in physical activities <coughs> since the screening? So when looking at kind of the metrics of how you've succeeded with your campaign, a lot of people are looking for quite short-term solutions. So okay, we screened the film and then the next day everyone became a vegetarian. Woo, we won. It's like, that doesn't happen. It's not as immediate as that in most cases. You need to think about tracking over a longer period and seeing kind of how you can track that. So um, about 60% um, of the older person settings that were working with the campaign said that they had an increased uh, participation level following screenings and that was information we were getting them three months and six months later um, kind of after that campaign had gone out and that's the work that Andrew was doing kind of after I left Brit Doc. but it was really vital to kind of know what it was on on the longer term rather than just the short term at that stage um, and this field question this is something that we discussed kind of in the session earlier today um, it's trying to work out why these things work and why is it that um, people want to take actions and change things. And the emotional connection is something that's really useful. So what I like about kind of this presentation is there's a kind of humor there to it. Like you're challenging the stereotypes that they're like, no, I don't need a dog. Like it's ridiculous and you laugh and you all laughed at it because it's, it's kind of funny. But it's that emotional connection and that relationship to that piece of media which makes you then do something different or potentially change. So the kind of the biggest thing that people were saying was they felt inspired. And actually, as a young person, like working solidly on that campaign for nearly two years, like I felt inspired about what I could then achieve kind of into my old age. And I used to call my grandma like way more because I was like, oh my God, like you're such a cool lady in your 80s and I don't talk to you enough and I should do that. And it's kind of, I had a, re a reaction to it, which was completely different to a 70 year old man um, who may have early onset um, Alzheimer's or dementia, but we could both, from that feeling of inspiration, we could both go in different kind of impact routes at that time. So it's, it's so critical to get that information um, back from people. And then it looks at kind of the building up of the campaign. So the kind of key thing that we do with our Work It Together films is looking at the kind of strategy for planning and resourcing of a project. 
Um, most of these campaigns, and if you just looked at the timeline that Active Killing just showed, I mean, it's like years of like thought and effort that have gone into some of these elements. Because if you're wanting to affect something on quite a large um, basis, you need to have not only kind of plan in your own mind what you want to achieve, but build partnerships with the relevant organizations. Most of those organizations work in very slow turnaround periods. Trying to get kind of an NGO partner to just put something on Facebook could take you two months because they have plans for everything else they're talking about. And if an urgent thing comes in, the Nepal disaster needs presence, your film thing is not gonna get talked about at that time. So you had to kind of build up um, in emotion. So the January is basically when um, the project managers that I hired for this campaign came on board, and it's kind of the building up of action throughout that year um, as it went forward. But I think stressing that element for planning um, far in advance is really important. Um, and also planning your evaluation of that project at the same time as planning the delivery of that project. Because you want to be able to say, like, this is what we actually managed to deliver and, and managed to succeed in. Um, so this is an example of um, some of the organisations that were partnered with the table tennis project. So um, this morning we were talking a lot about kind of the different audience groups you can go to and kind of bring together. So for example, like Age UK was the is the biggest organisation looking at ageing in the UK. So they were like an obvious go-to and they were our first partner. They wanted to do 200 events. It was really great to sign them on. But actually, it was also essential that I had the sports community. So I had to have the English Table Tennis Association because they knew all the table tennis clubs. If people in a care home were um, kind of wanting to do more activity, it's like, okay, can they join a club near them? So it was really essential that you had partners across the whole concept of your project and really thinking outside of just kind of film partners that you might work with. I'm going to wrap it up there for a moment. <laughs> Can we move on? Um, yeah, I think that was my 10 minutes. Was that my 10? Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Okay. So we really made a ride through um, different countries and uh, di very, very different projects. Um, so I think it's time to open up the questions for you. I would have a lot of questions, but um, please um, go for it. Yes? Wait for the micro. Yes, uh, I have a question for Bolzano project. Mm -hmm. I mean, thank you so much for the great journalism work. It, it was uh, based on the community and fact-checking, and also you created actually the change. I really appreciated what you do. And, um, but when it comes to the local journalism coverage, it's always the issue that we need to find the funding. And I was just curious how you could fund this project in terms of creating uh, this uh, web space and also having this uh, filmmakers come on board to actually do this. Mm -hmm. uh, also anthropologists, I understand that we're part of the team. So I was curious yeah. how you fund the project. I am very lucky because I'm a researcher at the university. So I've been founded by university because visual journalism is part of my research. So I use this case study as part of my personal and not personal academic research. So I've been founded with more or less 3,000 euro that I spent just to pay the, 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 the anthropologist because the anthropologist makes a lot of work with these eight guys because spent more than the time for the interview. She spent more or less two or three meeting for each person before in preparation for the interview in order to get in touch, getting their trust and so on. And it was a lot of time. And then we had the partnership with the local newspaper that um, but without any, he doesn't found it as, it's just promising that yes, the, the, they will publish the, the project even on the, news, the newspaper and that's it. But the problem, for example, of if you want to operate a change and you publish just on paper, it's a big problem because on paper news appear just for one day and then disappear instead of a website. So I guess, yes, you are right because needs a lot of money, a project like that. It's for that even on the uh, internet you don't see so much, so many times project of investigative or data journalism. Or if you meet some 
data journalist project is very short. It's about one chart and a small explanation. Because you need money, you need professionals, different professionals, because my approach is to involve different professionals in order to give different point of view, and yes, they need money. But it's also true that, I mean, I guess, what, what is New York Times is doing, or The Guardian, they are investing a lot in this kind of new way of telling stories and news, uh, and I guess, yes, you, they will be, they earn a lot of money, maybe not a lot, they earn money, that are um, com the same of the, the money they invested because I, I would imagine that this will be the future of online journalism. Oh, it's, it's okay? Okay. I, I would have a further question concerning the financing. I mean, you, Angelo, you were working with AMREF, with the uh, NGO, so I suppose that your work was um, uh, partly financed by AMREF, but you also said that you didn't take away any money from uh, from the association, so you had to to get no, the money. Yes. Yeah. Yes. No, we didn't take any money for, from the organization. One, that was the plan at the beginning. They said, okay, we do this, we try this project, but you don't use a single dollar for this. You have to find funds at other places. So they were either institutions or broadcasters, yes. Mm -hmm. And for the school, we had money that uh, were given by institution for the school, not through AMRA, but directly to the school. Mm -hmm. and, and for you, Sine, I mean, that, that must have been a big issue for you. Yeah. And, and then after Sine, I would like to ask also Sarah what, how the, the financial aspect is really also defining the outreach campaign and how to get these resources because I mean we are we are talking about change and change of ideas but we have to talk about money as well so that's why I think it's really important. Well the, the films are funded in the, the normal uh, film documentary film funding way with public service broadcasters in Europe, uh, film institutes and foundations and ministries and all that kind of thing and the outreach program for the act of killing uh, was purely foundations, um, and then with the Act of Killing we won Brit Dogs Impact Award, and so that went into the outreach of the Look of Silence together with more money that we fund fundraised for, from foundations. So yeah, it's basically foundation funded. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the funding element is, uh, yeah, the kind of big thing that needs the most planning kind of in the forefront. So. Um, for the ping pong example, um, we got £300,000 from the Big Lottery Fund, which is to date is the largest amount for a UK-only campaign um, here. And that's a significant amount of money. I mean, that's, that was more than the value of the film investment at the time. So um, it was significant, and our goals were quite large, and we wanted to reach quite a large number of people. Um, and we needed the infrastructure of hiring in two specific project managers for 12 months just working on that. We ran a series of engagement events um, that came through. But the way in which we kind of got to that funding position was we had to prove that the need was there and that this was going to make effective change within those communities. It wasn't just going to be seen as like an additional piece of the PR campaign. And I think that's the kind of real crucial element for a lot of filmmakers is that this isn't just about communication, but this is about actually significant change. And a foundation can smell it when they just think, oh, this is just about PR. Like, they want to make something good because it looks nice. Um, so the way in which we got to the particular funding for Ping Pong was that the film debuted at Sheffield in the June. We came out in cinemas um, over the summer. Um, the AGK relationship was formalized in... I think it was like the July, um, and so we put a bid into the lottery, it was about the August time, and that normally takes six months to review, it's quite a long turnaround, um, but we were able to get in, I think, a board meeting um, earlier, so they were able to review it in three months. But as part of that application, I mean, it's like a full-on business plan. I mean, I wrote the application initially, it was probably something like 50 pages long. I had to have um, evidence of audience, so what were the demographics, um, across the UK, why would I be targeting certain areas, which partners that I already built trust with, I was already working with AGK and others, what types of contacts within those partnerships was I working with. 
Um, so you had to have a huge amount of development and research to be able to go to that funder and say, this is why this should be supported and this is kind of the benefit that you'll see on the back end. And again, we actually went back and forth a lot with the lottery. So we had kind of um, what, was our, what were our outcomes going to be? So kind of what were we literally going to deliver um, in terms of logistical sense, but actually then what was going to be the impact of that delivery? And we went back and forth quite a lot of time because they were like, we love it, but let's just refine that and keep refining it and keep refining it. And I think that's the kind of clear thing is that you want to have a goal which you can really refine to like a sentence that is both achievable within your timescale and your team um, and also measurable because at the back end they're going to want to see. Mm -hmm. And I actually left BritDoc before Andrew wrote that amazing, I mean that report is like 100 pages long, it's so detailed because that's what those funders kind of expect. So the... I love the opportunity that is available with foundations and I think a number of filmmakers don't consider them as much as they should, but you absolutely have to be prepared to go in and see them, um, otherwise they will know that you're not ready yet for that investment and you need to be prepared. But Sabine, I think there's also two kinds of economy in this. There's the economy that you need for doing the initial outreach work and having a team and, and printing the DVDs that you want to give out and so on. And then there is the economy for all, in all the organizations that you're partnering with. And that's their own economy. And that's also what makes it sustainable. So you only really made it the moment that they take your film and use it anyway. And nothing can stop them from continuing. I mean, because then it's out there. Then it's being used by the real people who will still be there in five years' time, where you may not be around and, and the whole sort of press thing around the film and so on has, has happened already. They are the ones who have to hold the discussions and keep the debates and, and uh, bring it out to another community that they haven't reached yet and so on and want to do it because now it's part of their work. They have, they have taken ownership of it. Mm. And, and then it's, it's really working. And that economy is, is not something that you raise money for and that you have to give accounts for and stuff like that. That's, that's already their work. So, so I think for us, as, uh, we, we, can, we can do the seeds of stuff and we can try and find the right partners and give them the elements. And for example, do things like, okay, tell, even though a film is also a commercial venture, you tell all the other collaborators that you're working with from the very start that in this country you can give it out for free and they have to accept that and they can only be a partner on this project if they accept that. And then you have the ability to go out and give it out for free. And then the other organizations have the ability to take it on. But, but, uh, but it's such a long-term strategy and, and you are just the f or we are just the first little part of that strategy. So you, you have to, I mean, that's, that's a moment where it's really spreading, no? Yeah. I mean, you can push and push and push, uh, but it doesn't help unless you don't get the partners really involved. Mm. Mm. That's, is that right? Mm. So, more, more questions. Louise? Hi, thank you for this very enlightening presentation. Um, Sarah, I think, uh, points, points, to, <laughs> points to a scenario that is um, increasingly the case, which is that the funders have uh, expectations of what the results are going to be, and they want data on what, what impact did the Im impact campaign produce? Not just in terms of what they themselves uh, take on or initiate around the work that you do. So I wanted to ask the other panelists, how many of you were uh, required to or expected to meet certain goals uh, related to your outreach campaigns? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we, in our application, the, the, you have to answer certain questions about how many people are you going to reach, how, of course, there's a strategy part, how are you going to reach them, uh, in what time frame, and so on and so forth. And then when you report back, you, you have to address all those, the results, the, the, the numbers of people who you reached, and so on. Right. And then you're, we also... You're talking um, about a kind of data collection that I think is really, in many cases, without adequate funding, no, sure, absolutely, and, and actually we, I mean, we learned a huge amount from the, the impact award that BritDoc has. When you apply for that uh, and try to, to get your project in, into that pool of projects, 
there are, you get so many questions and you have to hand in articles and uh, coverage and in, uh, have interviews with the collaborators and I don't know what. And just, just giving them all that background information so they could make the assessment was a huge thing for us, but it was also extremely useful, we realized, because then they did this little case studies on the act of killing, and, and for, I mean, the most important thing was, of course, it, it won this award that we could then feed into the look of silence thing, but it also helped us, both us and the team in Indonesia, know what kind of questions we needed for other applications and so on, and what kind of information we needed to calculate on the go. And, and, I mean, our campaign is not at all finished. It's still going on in, in Indonesia, especially with the look of silence. But right now, we, the campaign is actually using both the films. But, but the look of silence is a new one. So, so this is it's, it's still, it's a still a long way to go before we have to report. But right now, we are trying to calculate on the go what, what, how many screenings and where and so on. I, I encourage that one of the reasons that... Um, the Impact Ward was started um, at Brit Doc. It was, I think it was Beedy who was really pushing it forward, was the idea that filmmakers weren't capturing the evidence. And actually, if there was a prize, it would force filmmakers to actually think about what is the evidence that they have to hand. It works. So it was literally like the way of running. We're like, if we gave them a cash prize, <laughs> would they put the evidence in? But it was, I think it was Beedy who was the biggest fan of it, and Jess. Um, but that's one of the reasons why the award started, was actually like, do you have any of this data? So I'd encourage anybody, um, the next time it's online, to just have a look at the application form as a way of looking at what the kind of questions were. And, all the, and all the case studies, because every everyone, that all the film's uh, case studies are... Uh, also publicized. So you yeah. can see, uh, and, and people do quite different things with the films in different areas. So there's a lot of inspiration to be found there. Yeah, it's at um, britdoc.org slash evaluation. That's where they usually are hosted on there. So have a look at those. Um, and I think it's, it's like a thing of like, there's, there's certain data points that you kind of get, like you can ask your broadcaster, like, do you have your ratings figures <laughs> for the broadcast? So there's certain things that like, you probably might not always ask, but actually is available if you just thought about it. But yeah, keeping track of like how many screenings you did, where they were, um, asking your partner kind of programs that like, well, we gave you 100 DVDs, have they all gone out? Do you still have some? Kind of trying to check in on a regular basis and kind of keeping that information as you go through rather than trying to scramble everything on the, the, the last day. Kind of the more you can keep knowledge of as you work through it, the kind of easier it is. But, really. but it's also complicated because then, especially when you give out DVDs, you know how many DVDs you have and you can give them out. And the first group of people who get them will report back because they, they know about the whole system where they got them from. But then the DVDs start to wander. And that's great. It's a success because it's going from one to the other. But they are having all kinds of screenings that you don't know about unless someone one day write to, a, to you and say, oh, we had this screening in this place and you never heard about it. So it's, it's, it's great to do it, but it's mm. also tough to do it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's not a perfect art at the moment, no. by any means. So, are there other questions? So, yeah, please. Is there a reason you said you read a 200-page uh, Maybe you wait for the <coughs> mic microphone. Is there a resource for looking at business plans that are available? Um, I would suggest, because the one that's the most crazy is whenever you have to apply to Creative Europe, it's like slightly going through hell having to write those applications. If anyone's done it here, you will know. Um, but it triggers quite a lot of the questions. That basically, what they're asking you for is a very detailed kind of business plan. It's like, what's the proposition of your project? Who's your intended target audience? What's your line by line budget? So, having a look at them because it's set out in a very detailed form, and every question they have guidelines. Like, this is what we want you to write here. I think anybody who wants to try and in increase their knowledge of that, I would try and write a Creative Europe application and trigger those questions. But actually, once you've done that, you've got a really good framework for kind of what you might need elsewhere, I'd say. That's really helpful. Yeah, there is another question right behind you. Uh, thanks very much for the session. It's great, actually, and very heartening. Um, I was just wondering, in terms of actually killing and look of silence, but what, at what point did you actually apply for the Impact Award? Because you mentioned that it allowed you to put money into mm. silence rather than retrospectively for act of killing. Can I just clarify? Yeah. Well, um, maybe I should say something about the whole sort of 
process we was we were doing because until spring 2012 we were so focused on just finishing the act of killing that 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 was that was key and that was all we could think about and we were still financing the film and but then in spring 2012 we could see the end of the tunnel and we knew okay now the act of killing is going to come out by uh, hopefully at that time we it wasn't selected for those festivals that it came out at Telluride and Toronto but we were hoping for that uh, so we, we went to Indonesia and we had meetings with both with our teams and all these organizations, representatives of organizations that we wanted to involve. So history, stu uh, teachers, associations, students, associations, uh, human rights organizations, those kind of people. And that's when we found out about doing this thing where we, we focused on community screenings and didn't go for the commercial release. And that's also where we um, had those talks with the lawyers about what we could do and couldn't do and, and how we could make sure that nobody in Indonesia who were distrib distributing the film would get into trouble. And so that's when we made the first plan. We sort of, we, we wrote it down as some principles and we did a budget for uh, how can we, what, what, do we, what team do we need, uh, how many people do we need to, to do this where they both have to do the practical stuff of around uh, organizing a premiere, organizing as many screenings as possible, getting the DVDs out, getting a, a study guide made uh, that also would advise people how to do closed screenings and if they want to do them openly, how they should do that and so on. And uh, so all that work started in spring 2012. Then the film had its international premiere end of August 2012, beginning of, of September. Um, and that's, of course, when it first was also realized by the, the Indonesian press. There were some journalists that knew about the project because they knew known about it for a long time. And also some of these organizations had known, like the, uh, the National Human Rights Commission in Indonesia had known about the work for a long time. And they had even used some of the, the, uh, the stuff as evidence, some of the material in some report that they were also publishing around the same time. But for example, we, when you premiere in an international film A festival, they want your trailer very early on. And we realized all of a sudden in, I think, July 2012, we can't give out this trailer because we're not ready. We're not ready for whatever reaction we will get from Indonesia. So we ended up only releasing everything at the same time as it was coming out in Telluride, also the trailer. And then, of course, the newspapers and journalists in Indonesia knew about it. And uh, then, uh, our team had a lot of screenings for journalists in Indonesia and one uh, and also for filmmakers and uh, uh, writers and anyone who could be interested in this and were when and could maybe uh, contribute to raising uh, a public debate about it we, we would invite them for screenings and, and discussions about the whole thing and then one very important thing happened there was a, a magazine called Tembo which is a political magazine like Time magazine but in Indonesian language and they decided to, to sort of test us to, to check if Anwar was a special case or if they could find people talking like Anwar all around Indonesia. And so they sent their journalists out to all these corners of Indonesia and had interviews made with perpetrators to see what would they say. And they came back with a, a huge amount of, of, of documentation that people were talking exactly like Anwar. And then they did a 75-page special edition in their magazine that came out in, in October. 30th of September is a key day in Indonesia for this. That's the day where the, the dictatorship for many, many years celebrated uh, the killings as the, the sort of uh, the place, the time when, when uh, Indonesia was, was, uh, got rid of communism. So around that date that we knew that that would be a key date for having debate about these things. And then Tempo published their magazine. And then the other, that sort of broke the ice. That meant that a lot of other journalists who wouldn't have written about these things before dared to put stuff about the, the film, about the, the issue in their newspapers. And then we used another key date, which was the 10th of December. We had first, around this time, we also had a premiere in, in, in Jakarta which was a closed event by invitation only. And then on the 10th of December, we started uh, our screenings. And uh, on that day, there were 30 screenings around the country organized. And that's the 10th of December is International Human Rights Day. So we were sort of latching onto that as a, as a key date. 
And then we had all these screenings through all these organizations happening throughout the year. And every time we had anything mentioned in the international press about the film, then we would feed that to the Indonesian team and then they would feed their Indonesian journalists writing about now the film is in Copenhagen Docks in Denmark or now the film is in getting it released in cinemas in France or now it's coming out in the US and so on. And on the other hand, we would also get news from Indonesia when, when for example, there was a, a one, the only sort of violent attack we've had was a one to, uh, editor of a newspaper who they published an article saying the world condemned Pamuda Pantashila, which is the paramilitaries, and that made the Pamuda Pantashila march on his office and they beat him up. The police got him out of there and he doesn't have long term problems, but he was beaten up. And so we could feed that also into the international press and explain about what has happened in Indonesia. And then, in connection with the sort of the last phase of, of this whole campaign, happened up because the film was Oscar nominated then we, it got us like the last chance we know we had we have this window <laughs> where the international press and the Indonesian press will write about it because it got the world's attention in that sense and as part of that whole process we work with for example Amnesty International in in the US and they pushed um, there was a senator who brought up the whole issue of, of uh, the, the U.S.'s involvement in what happened in Indonesia, and also the, the documents that are still quali uh, uh, classified about that, and wanting, demanding that these uh, documents get declassified. And there was also organizations that uh, organized like a projection of the act of killing on the world of the World Bank to show that how all these institutions are completely involved and have been involved with the dictatorship in Indonesia dictatorship until 98, but after that, so-called democracy. But if you see the act of killing, you, you know what I mean by that. Um, so we were trying to use this window to get as much publicity as possible. And in Indonesia, the first thing that happened was these other journalists, or lots of journalists, started to write about it. But then also local people started acting. There was actually one mayor in one town who was the first sort of official person. He wasn't on a national level, he was on a, on a city level, you can say. And he went, came out and said, I was a guard when I was 16, and now I'm the mayor, and I want my community to live together, and I think this is important, and we need to talk about it, and we need to screen the film and talk, have discussions and so on. He was the first one, and then later, right before the Oscar show, probably because the, the government of Indonesia was worried that the film would actually win, which, of course, it didn't. But then they, they thought that, and that made them come out with a statement that said, sort of, we, uh, we recognize that these atrocities happened in Indonesia, calling them atrocities for the first time. And, uh, and of course, we don't need a film to talk about it, but, uh, or, or to, to make us talk about it. But, but at least they recognized it, and that hadn't happened before on a national level, and, and that happened then. This was only the act of killing, so now we haven't <laughs> talked about it. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Sina. Just to, to wrap up, um, uh, I, would, I would like to come back after all these reflections about the out outreach and about the, the process that is going on after the film is finished. I would like to come back to the, to the making and to the, um, to, the, to the media that you were using. How much this pre-thinking of the of the, the outrage campaign, of the, the strategy, etc. Just in, in one or two sentences. We have to wrap up really soon, you're already over time. Yes, okay. Just, <laughs> just, one, just one sentence, how much this influenced the making of the, the product. Angelo. Uh, the first product we did was called TV Islam, because we had this uh, vision of creating a uh, local TV. We didn't do that, but it was in the plan to have a long-term project. So we were starting, but we didn't know where we, where we were heading to. Okay. Matteo, mm -hmm. um, how much, I mean, how, how much this influenced the quality, the quality, the approach, et cetera, of, of you towards the, the mm. project? Sorry, I was a little bit distracted before. <laughs> so, so the question is, how much what the, the, yeah, how the, much the, the planning or how yeah, how much this thinking about the audience, about your yeah, yeah. community, about your user influenced the making the making of the product? Yeah, a lot because we, the media, because we refer to people that use the internet. So with a short attention span, so it's crucial for the choices the choice we made, 
and and then we, we spent a lot of time planning because yes we had a lot of meeting more or less six months before finishing the project that in the end it was made in a week because it's a website in the end but yeah the, the media it's the, the one of the most crucial the media and the users of course okay so okay. Yeah. thank you very much <laughs> sorry <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.